taking a look at this slide, you can see various active pharmaceutical ingredients that have one thing in common, and this is the chiral amine moiety. And this chiral amine moiety is the reason why the enzyme of my today's talk has become a lot of attention in the last decades. Transaminases, also called aminotransferases, they generally catalyze the reversible transfer of an amino group between two compounds. An amino donor, that is an amino acid or an amine that has no carboxylic group at all, and an amine acceptor, that is an ketone, an acetone, or a keto acid, for example. In the middle, there is very essential the mediator, BLP, which is the pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Transaminases can be categorized according to their um, recognition of a specific amino group. This means, for example, the alpha amino acid transaminases, they recognize an amino group that is next to the C-alpha atom at, in an amino acid. Moreover, there are transaminases that recognize amino groups that are not next to the C-alpha atom, and then they are referred to as omega transaminases. Um, additionally, there are transaminases that recognize um, amines that have no carboxylate group, and then they are referred to as amine transaminases. Moreover, we can um, differentiate between the selectivities of the transaminases, being the S or the R selective transaminase. The beginning of transaminases as biocatalysts was in the late 1990s to the early 2000s when Shin and Kim identified the first omega transaminase by enrichment-based cultivation from Klebsiella pneumonia and Bacillus thuringiensis. They just fed, I think in this case, it was alpha methylbenzylamine as a main nitrogen source. And then they identified those two um, yeah, omega transaminases in these organisms. With the same method, the, also, the um, S-specific omega transaminase from Mibio cruvialis was identified by Shin and Kim. And everything, or nearly everything we know these days about transaminases, comes from the early investigations of those two scientists um, with S-specific omega transaminase from Mibio fluvialis. So they already got an idea of structure reactivity relationship. And um, yeah, they identified some active site in, um, amino acids that are important and so on. The first R-specific omega transaminase was identified in Atropactor using a similar approach where they investigated dimethoxyamphetamines as a main nitrogen source, and then they identified this R-specific omega transaminase. Another really important transaminase available this day um, is the S-specific omega transaminase from Chromobacterium myuratium, um, which finds a lot of investigation in the biocatalysis. Over the years, however, a lot of other transaminases have been discovered using several different approaches. And here you can see an overview of those that are mostly used these days, or the organism, which harbor at least one very well often used transaminase. Most of them are S-selective. However, also a lot of R-selective ones were identified, mainly using a motive-based searching. And this motive-based searching goes back to Bonchera's group, where they investigated a motive-based searching algorithm without the knowledge of any crystal structure. And they just identified um, 17 different transaminases with the um, already known um, motives in R, um, Amino uh, R transaminase from Atropacta. Going more into the structural mechanism, we can divide this so called ping pong mechanism of transaminases in two different half reactions. The first half reaction starts with the resting pyridoxal 5 phosphate that has a lysine covalently bond, forming a shift space. Once the alanine, which is in this case our amine donor, comes into the active site, it initiates the reaction and after a nucleophilic attack forms an external aldimine that um, after the deprotonation forms a plana kinoid and after protonation a ketamine that hydrolyzes to pyruvate and pyridoxamine phosphate. In a second half reaction, 
we are going the other way around and we are introducing our ketone, which is our amine acceptor, and releasing in the end the amine donor. This mechanism here shown, especially uh, in particular for the S-specific transaminase, is similar in all the transaminases. One thing that is different is the fold type. BLB-dependent enzyme can have seven different fold types and two of them can be assigned to transaminases, the fold type one and the fold type two, uh, five, four. And these two fold types, they possess, um, are homodimers, so they possess two subunits, the subunit A and the subunit B. And on the interface of these two subunits, we have our active site. And in some cases, transaminases have two of these homodimers, then they have two active sites possessing um, two BLP inside. The active site of transaminases is, as you can see here, here, out of a B bucket and an O bucket. The B bucket is the smaller bucket that is above the phosphate group of the BLP, and the O bucket is above the oxygen group um, of the BLP. The B bucket is responsible for binding the side chain that is a methyl or an ethyl group. And the O bucket, this can, in this bucket, we can bind an aryl, acyl, or even our carboxylic acid group. And the reason why we can bind these different so hydrophobic groups as well as carboxylic groups is a so-called flipping arginine residue shown here for the full type 1. This R flipping arginine residue can either flip out of the active site when we have an aromatic compound here, or it can form the salt bridge when we have a car carboxylic acid group here. And this fold type one is the most abundant fold type. So it includes several different aromatic amino acid transaminases, but also our S amine transaminase. Moreover, as already mentioned before, we have the fold type four. This one includes the l branch chain amino acid transaminase, uh, transferase, for example, but also our R-specific amine transaminase that has also this uh, P bucket responsible for binding a methyl group or the O bucket that can bind different um, substitutions here. So now we know a little bit about the structural basics. So what are transaminases capable of performing, doing? They can perform kinetic resolution, asymmetric synthesis, and deracinization. And as I think that most of you are aware of all those terms, I would not like to explain this in detail. However, you can see that in all the cases, we can synthesize enantiopure amines, just with different um, maximum possible yields. A big problem, however, of transaminases is their thermodynamics. The equilibrium of transaminases is usually favored toward the reactant site. Moreover, we also have the problem of product inhibition, that the ketone that is formed as a byproduct in most cases inhibits our enzyme, and therefore not that much substrate can be converted to a product. So there are different approaches to overcome this problem. Most of them are related to the amino donor. The most famous amino donor that is used is the L-alanine. However, there is a problem because L-alanine only works with S-selective transaminases. For our specific transaminases, we need to investigate the D-alanine. Another very famous amino donor is isopropylamine. Isopropylamine, on the under, other hand, is not racemic, so it has no stereo center, and therefore it can be investigated in S or R specific transaminase reactions. Moreover, isopropylamine is quite cost effective and the byproduct that is formed, the ketone, can be removed out of the reaction by evaporation quite easily. The problem of those two amino donors, however, is still the unfavored re reaction equilibrium towards the reactant site. And therefore, there are other approaches to overcome this problem. One is definitely the investigation of a high excess of the already mentioned amino donors. For example, there was a publication, I think, where they investigated a 16-fold excess of alanine in order to get to a near 100% conversion of the substrate. Moreover, we can also use some removal or recycling systems or a smart amino donor that is not where it's not necessary to use that high excess. The 
idea of this removal system is that we get rid of the produced ketone out of our system. And one idea is to investigate an organic solvent. So you just try to extract your, ke extract your ketone out of the reaction mixture by a biphasic mixture, and then you do not have the problem of product inhibition or so on. And however, there is one big problem that organic solvents, they're not really yeah, good with transaminases or enzymes at all. So there are ideas of membrane-backed reactors in order to avoid the direct contact of organic solvents and the enzyme. Then there are methods using reduced pressures. So as already stated with the acetone, we can try to remove our ketone by evaporation just by reducing the pressure. And most favored are enzymatic reductions. So you just, as shown here for pyruvate, for example, you try to let pyruvate react to something else, and then it's not possible to react back on further to the um, alanine, and um, yeah, it pushes the equilibrium towards our product side by investigating, for example, a lactate dehydrogenase or a pyruvate decarboxylase. Moreover, we can also directly recycle our, um, our biorate back to alanine using an alanine, alanine dehydrogenase. And this pushes the re reaction and equilibrium towards the reductive amination. If you're interested in something else, you can use um, some so-called smart amine donors like xylimine diamine or cataverine shown here on the left side. Those two smart amine donors have the advantage that, for example, here shown with xylidine diamine, that once it reacts in a transaminase reaction, it forms a compound that polymerizes and precipitates, so a color, a color precipitate. And this can be then used for screening the transaminase towards a set of different ketones. When we investigate compounds like cataverin, these are these very uh, poly, um, diamines, so these long chain diamines, this one, once they react, they cyclize, and then they are not able anymore to react back to the um, original diamine and to the original substrate. In 2018, there um, was another idea published by so-called in situ product crystallization. So you have your amine of interest and let it crystallize with a specific acid, and then you can just remove this crystal out of your reaction mixture and pull the um, uh, equilibrium towards your um, amine, towards your product site. So additionally to equilibrium engineering, we can also engineer our protein in order to accept several new substrates. Because already mentioned at the beginning, we have the problem of this small binding pocket that doesn't allow us to bind anything else than a methyl or an ethyl group. When we, for example, they cure the S-selective um, transaminase from Vibrio fluvialis. Therefore, a lot of scientists have put effort in engineering this area to accept much more compounds. And I just give you an overview because there was so much done in protein engineering of transaminases. Um, I give you an overview here of a set of different substrates uh, where um, especially Bornschauer's group put a lot of effort in. Um, yeah, they did some molecular dynamic studies, quantum mechanics, um, also intelligent discovery and directed evolution and so on, in order to um, mostly engineer Vibrio fluvialis transaminase or Chromobacterium transaminase. The idea of this um, way of Engineering the protein was already done in 2010 for the synthesis of cetagliptin. This is a active pharmaceutical ingredient that is used for the treatment of think, Alzheimer. And usually it was synthesized by rhodium-based catalysis. And they thought that the transaminases, they have the chemistry to perform the reaction. However, as I already told you before, it would not be possible to accept subs, uh, pre substrate like or a pre cetagliptin like this. And therefore, they performed several rounds of mutagenesis. They did substrate walking and modeling. And in the end, they were able to move from the original chemocatalytical route to the biocatalytical route with the um, specific um, transaminase from Vibrio fluvialis 
with really, really nice and anti-selectivities of more than 99%. Another idea of protein engineering of transaminases is the creation of a scaffold uh, of an activity, in this case, our aiming transaminase activity, with an already ex existing scaffold of the alpha amino acid transaminase. This alpha amino acid transaminase is said to be the origin of all the transaminases, and therefore they just um, take a look at the active site of the two um, amino acid transaminases. And by exchanging, I think it was six different amino acids in this in the scaffold of a D amino acid transaminase, they obtained the R amine transaminase activity and still keeping the activity of the original amino acid transaminase. If you're interested in forming your own um, mutagenesis with transaminases, there are also also databases available where you can get an idea of sequences and structures of various different omega transaminases. So with the perfect protein in hand, we can now investigate them in different cascade reactions where transaminases are really favored of. And for example, the synthesis of amines out of alcohols is quite interesting because as you can see in an um, application um, from um, also Crudil, um, from Crudil, they investigated an alcohol dehydrogenase together with a transaminase, investigating also an alanine dehydrogenase for the recycling. They could couple the recycling of the L-alanine, uh, of the pyruvate to the L-alanine together with the NADH recycling. An additional application of transaminases in a cascade reaction, as shown here, um, is the synthesis of terminal am amines out of acid methyl esters by combining an alcohol dehydrogenase together with an alkane monooxygenase and, as we said, the transaminase. And then there are ideas of producing two chiral centers with an um, transketolase or carbon ligation and then a transaminase reaction. Moreover, also beta-substituted cyclic amines um, out of an enamine reductase together with a transaminase um, were synthesized. And especially the alkaloid synthesis profits a lot from the transaminase um, cascades or cascades including the transaminases for especially the synthesis of pyrrolidine alkaloids by investigating a transaminase together with a reductive amination um, with reductive aminases proved quite successfully with more than 70% isolated yield and also really nice in antiselectivities and yeah. They, in this case, they investigated also, as stated before, this removal system of the pyruvate with um, lactate dehydrogenase. And for the cofactor recycling, they investigated the glucose dehydrogenase. Additionally, also, um, the um, dehydrobinidina was synthesized with a um, cascade involving a transaminase by combining a big liver esterase together with the transaminase and a reductive stack with the amine reductases. But it's not just the enzymatic cascades that yeah, attracts transaminases, also chemoenzymatic synthesis really likes transaminases, especially for the synthesis of active pharmaceutical ingredients, as stated in the very first big slide. Um, and I just have one example here from our group where they synthesized chemoenzymatically the S form of rivastigmine using the transaminase either in R, first in R or S selectivity and then with some organochemical um, steps they finally got the S enantiomer of rivastigmine and quite high antiselectivities. So now we can see that transaminases are really, really good for those applications and are really good for industrial applications. However, there is always a need of making the enzyme more robust and reusable, and therefore it's no wonder that a lot of effort has been put into a mobilization of transaminases, which was working quite well in the older cases. And I just give you some idea how they, for example, immobilized the purified enzyme by using covalent linkage, or in this case, by using um, metal affinity. So they just attached the adulator here, and then they put the nickel ion and the histidines of the 
um, amine transaminase yeah bind to the nickels it was also possible to with with iron atoms for example iron cations moreover also whole cell transaminase biocatalysts were investigated by immobilizing um, the whole E. coli cell harboring the overexpressed transaminase in a salt gel matrix, matrix and then uh, by batch reaction or continuous flow operations um, perform kinetic resolution of a set of different um, yeah, amines. And here you can see already that transaminases, yeah, they have so many different kind of applications and a, and a huge um, investigation in industrial application. And therefore, it's no wonder that all of those scientists given the face here have put their effort in identifying even more transaminases in biocatalytic reactions and so on. And they're still for, uh, putting a lot of effort in the investigation of a lot of transaminases. Yeah, and that's it. Thanks for your attention. And yeah, if there are any questions, do not hesitate to ask.